I'm going to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody here to what is the last of the fall uh, semester of the Research Exchange. Thank you if you've been coming to these. We've been having them since August, September. We'll start again on January 29th, I believe, but we'll have a nice extended break until then. Um, we have, we're very pleased to have Andrew Hardigan here. Hargadon here. I have a few announcements before we get started with his talk. Uh, first, on Monday, December 8th at 4 o'clock, we'll have Dan Sperling give a distinguished speaker talk here in 290. Uh, Dan is the Director of Institute in Transportation Studies at UC Davis, talking about two billion cars and California climate policy. So that should be an exciting talk. He actually has a new book, and we're going to be raffling off copies of his new book. Um, and then you are all invited to next Friday. We have our Citrus Holiday Gala. This will be out in the lobby from 4 to 6 p.m. And then at 6 p.m. we have a following the Holiday Gala next Friday. We're going to have a little theater performance about art and culture and technology. So there's talks. There's a flyers in the back. We hope to see you there. Um, of course, thank you to Infineon for providing the sandwiches that you're all enjoying, and hello to the webcasters. So, um, I mean, to the web viewers, we're the webcasters, the web viewers. We're hoping next semester to webcast some of the research exchanges from the, some of the other Citrus campuses. So, we will, we'll gather here, as they do at the other campuses, and watch their talks, you know, live and communicate that way. So, that'll be an exciting change. We'll try next semester as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Hargadon. He is going to talk to us today about the networks of green innovation, and he is at the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. And uh, uh, clearly, this is a testimony to the, to the quality of food. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, uh, let's see. What I want to do today is talk about uh, innovation, and particularly green innovation, meaning those, those ideas, those innovations that are in some way sustainable. Uh, in looking over the stories, actually, I realized that what I'm really going to talk about are, are energy, uh, clean energy uh, innovations. But I'm, I, I'm going to do it from my own research background, which is as a business historian, really. And so I'm going to talk uh, from the perspective of, of 100 plus years looking back on innovations. And one of the things that I'll point out just briefly before I get started is there's an enormous value. This is a small plug for history here. There's an enormous value to looking at an innovation, that particular topic, from the distance of a century or two because what you find in looking at any innovations that are within 30 years, it's sort of never trust anybody over 30, never trust an innovation under 30 because there's so many stories around about how they got started that history hasn't yet managed to filter out uh, and, and really um, clean up. So what I really want to talk about today is what makes a great uh, innovation, great green innovation, and, and perhaps more specifically, what makes a green innovation great? Why is it that some succeed and others don't? And what, it is, what is it about the idea and what else is there that we need to be paying attention to uh, if in these particular times, as I think we're all pretty aware, we're in dire need of, of new and green innovations. So let me start with a, a, a story, a very, a very brief story, to put this in context. This is Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush, uh, many of you might know, actually, in fact, Berkeley's done very well by Vannevar Bush. Uh, many of you may not know him. He, was, uh, he served essentially as the uh, science advisor to President Roosevelt in World War II. He oversaw uh, an office of scientific research that produced in World War II, it actually probably represented the greatest mobilization of scientists uh, ever, and, and in, entirely possibly ever again, with over 30,000 scientists working under him, uh, developing the Manhattan Project, the Nordson bomb site, sonar, radar, these guys had the hand in penicillin, uh, any number of, of technological innovations that came out of World War II. And it was in 1945, after the war, that President Roosevelt asked uh, Vannevar Bush how, two things. One of which was, how are we going to make light or make public all of the scientific achievements that we accomplished in World War II? And second, how are we going to continue the momentum? How are we, in fact, going to make this work better? So it was in that context that Vannevar Bush produced in 1946 his answer, which was The Endless Frontier. It was an essay 
essentially a report, talking about how the U.S. government should remain involved in science going forward. Now, prior to World War II, the U.S. government really wasn't that involved in science. There was funding, but it was indirect, and a lot of the scientists, particularly on campus, actually resisted the control of the federal government in, in, their, in their work. But the Endless Frontier really changed all that. Now, what's interesting is he actually tried to create an independent body that would oversee the dispensation of those funds. His idea in spirit lived on. His actual plan didn't. What you ended up with instead was the way the federal government works now, where research grants come from any number of different bodies, many of which are politically controlled. But nonetheless, really, Vannevar Bush's lasting legacy came in the form of a, of a framework for understanding innovation. And that framework, Donald Stokes wrote about it wonderfully in a, in a book called Pastor's Quadrant. That framework is really that basic science is the, is the wellspring of all innovation. And, and ideas move from basic science to applied science out into industry. And if, if, if you want to make America great, if you want to make America a leader technologically and economically, you need to fund basic science. Now, you know, I'm not going to bite the hand that feeds me any more than anybody else will, but it's important to recognize, particularly Stokes' perspective, which is that a lot of innovation doesn't necessarily follow that path from basic science down. But what I want to talk about more specifically today is, of even those innovations that do follow that path, why do they follow that path, and why do some succeed where others don't? So with that perspective, I think I really want to set the context for what science is like, and, and particularly the role of scientific innovations in America today, how we perceive science and its role in getting us out of the problems that we have today. And a lot of that you can see now in the policy debates about whether, you know, how much we should be funding more science, more basic science research to help with climate change, for example. So it's with that context that I want to talk about another green tech innovation. This takes us back a little ways, though. So this is James Watt. What's interesting to me, at least, as a researcher, was uh, uncovering some of the story that I had not been told before. In 1769, James Watt had burned through about 2,000 pounds of his investors' money. He'd had a personal breakdown. He'd lost his family, or his wife. He had to, he had to quit working on the steam engine, walked away from it in order to get another job, came back, had to walk away again to get another job, come back. He was, at, at, at that point, done. He was essentially, for all purposes, done with developing the steam engine. Uh, what happened? The question I want to I come back to, what makes an idea great? Actually, you could ask in 1769 exactly. Why is it that we remember what? Why is it that he has a unit of energy named after him? So to go back 10 years before that, in 1759 roughly, uh, there was a professor at Glasgow who went to a local instrument maker, James Watt, and said, I have a Newcomen steam engine. They're in use in mines all over England. Uh, it's, everybody understands them. Everybody, everybody you know, has, has worked with them well. I'd like, to my, I'd like to repair mine. I'm using it for demonstrations in class. Watt started working on it. In the interaction with Glass, Glass said, well, you know, these steam engines are really reaching the, the, the boundary of their performance. As, as coal mines get deeper, these steam engines were used to pump water out of the mines. Uh, as, the, as the mines got deeper, more water came in. The pumps were having to work harder. They were terribly inefficient. I think you got about 1% of, uh, of the total energy stored in the coal you used to burn to boil the water to, to run the steam engine you got back in terms of work. Uh, and, and it was actually limiting what the mines could pull out of the ground. So he said, I think anybody who could really understand why these things are so inefficient and could make them more inefficient really has something. So Glass then proceeded to oversee Watt and his study of the engine and try and understand what was it that made it so inefficient and what could be made better. And Watt began to work on it. And he actually, in, in sort of classic doctoral student, sort of apprentice process, came up with a brilliant idea. He recognized the, the, there's an enormous waste of energy with having the, the steam condense in the very same piston in which the work was being done because that piston would then heat up to the temperature of steam, cool down to the temperature of condensed water, heat up again 40 times in a, in a minute. 
So what he created was a separate condenser. Uh, and that, that small innovation alone, roughly uh, uh, was it, quadrupled the efficiency of the machine. In other words, for the, for, excuse me, let me see if I get that math right up here. 25% of the same, uh, yeah, 20, for the same amount of work, 25% of the coal was used, which is an enormous savings. And he demonstrated that in his laptop equipment, got funding from somebody else of 1,000 pounds and began working. And 10 years later, he was still working on it, although he had almost given up. He was ready to give up. What Watt experienced, and in fact, in 1769, I think we could probably have said, that's the end of him. We would still have steam engines. There were another two dozen or so inventors working on improved Newcomen engines at the time. We would still have steam engines. We would still have improved steam engines, but we wouldn't have had his improved steam engine. Now, what made the difference? First, let me put it in perspective again. There's not a whole lot of, of, of novelty to Watt's failure. In fact, this is, there's something called the valley of death. It's an entrepreneurial term. It refers to a lot of new ideas. And what happens is new ideas, this is, happens to be the valley of death for, for scientific research. But new ideas start out, and in their early stages, they don't cost very much. And usually people are working on them either you know, through grants or nights and weekends you know, with their day job. But at a certain point, they need to commit to building the idea. And what happens as they commit is they begin to incur expenses that exceed their income. And, and in this case, they run out of money. And in their deepest depths, probably very similar to Watt, they begin to lose family, they begin to lose friends, they begin to lose hope before then coming out and finally getting to market and making the money back. The valley of death really refers to why so many ideas don't make it to market. Now, interestingly, we have a sort of uh, this notion of the valley of, well, no, we have this empirical experience with the valley of death, but we have sort of the ever-present optimism, which re is reflected also in Vannevar Bush's notion of science proceeding in all innovations that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. That in fact, good ideas will out. They will come out because they were better ideas. Now there's a wonderfully tautological defense here because in fact, if the idea doesn't come out, it couldn't possibly have been good, proving the thesis that good ideas will come out. But in fact, it simply doesn't work that way as Watt and others have found, or at least Watt in 1769 had found. And, and there's a wonderful study by a guy, Jack Hope, who looked at the patent data. And since the patent office in 1828, what he found was there were over 4,400 mousetraps patented. So how many do you think ever made any money? <laughs> Close. 24. 24 of those patents ever generated revenue. And of those, how many sort of dominant technological designs do we have? <laughs> We have two, actually. The Snap Trap, which was uh, Victor, the, the company that's so well known now, was actually the original company in 1897, it was called Woodstream then, that first introduced the Snap Trap mousetrap. Hasn't changed really since. The greatest technological advance of the mousetrap has been the plastic, you know, the cheese scented plastic. But the other, now the other, other design for the mousetrap that has made any money and has stayed in the market is the Sticky Trap which is, it came in in about the 1970s, it's industrial adhesive, slapped on cardboard, shrink-wrapped and sold as a cleaner solution. Uh, that persists today because it is so easy to set up, but if anybody's ever caught a mouse in that glue trap, you, you immediately go back to the snap trap. The point though that I want to make with this is statistically speaking, the valley of death is there because in fact, you know, in this case, 4,398 times out of 4,400, most ideas don't make it successfully in the marketplace. So what, they really want, you know, what, I, what I want to come back to then is why is it that Watt became successful? What was it? Was it about his idea? Was it, was it his idea itself? I don't know how many of you are familiar with, were, with biology and the, sort of the original debates around uh, evolution. But there was an original notion of the homunculus, which was within every human embryo, egg, there was a tiny person that simply grew in size. And all of the features of that person were already fixed within that egg. 
at the time it was fertilized. And in fact, the way it worked out, and this is sort of like angels dancing on the head of a pin, was that every person that would ever exist were in the eggs of Adam and, and, and or of Eve, excuse me. And they were simply so small that they could all be collected. And you know, that, that only ran 7,000 years back, so it was relatively easy to keep up with the population. The notion is, is actually still prevalent in our understanding of technological evolution, which is that somehow the idea itself contains within it all of the features of the final innovation that will have all of the impact that it does have. And therefore, it is the idea that's most important, the mousetrap that's most important. And we shouldn't look at what happens after the mousetrap has been conceived until, in fact, it hits the market, and then we can study its impacts. This is, in many ways, sort of Vannevar Bush's policy around science, the policy that we've read and lived for the last 50 years, which is if you fund enough basic science, we'll generate the little ideas, the little homuncular ideas, which will themselves grow to become enormously successful technological innovations. And we're neglecting the process in between. What happens in between that makes an idea great? So why is it important in green innovation? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow Tom Friedman's phrase because uh, he's clearly the, the spokesman now. From his book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, he says, you know, we're not going to regulate our way out of our problems. We can only innovate our way out. This is simply to, re to, to reinforce the notion that green innovation is being looked at as our savior. And that makes all the more important our understanding of what green innovation is and how it happens. Because if, if the next logical step is green innovation is critical, therefore we should fund basic science, we're missing a number of other steps, a number of other actions, and particularly policy implications that we really need to be sensitive to. How do we get across that valley of death primarily? So what you can see, though, is we're clearly doing this, right? I don't know, I mean, I can give you any number of numbers. This is, the, this is the number from venture capital. If you look, annual venture capital investments, they went 446 million up to 2 billion. It's actually 2008 was 4 billion. And we were looking, into, uh, we're looking at this year as, as sort of uh, around a $4 billion investment in clean energy, in these green innovations. And I actually, having, having worked with a number of these companies, can tell you that they are as much suffering from the same notions as Vannevar Bush did. So let's talk about the steam engine then. How did it happen? What was it that made Watt's steam engine so successful? It's really simple. How many of you have heard of Matthew Bolton? Yeah, great. <laughs> this is wonderful. I'll take any. Uh, what happened to Watt and his steam engine was Matthew Bolton. Very few people have heard of Bolton. He didn't get a unit of energy named after him. He should have. Uh, and, and what happened was actually a relationship which sheds an enormous amount of insight on the innovation process. So James Watt was a classic engineer. I was an en I, I was. I'm an engineer too, so I, I kind of sympathize with him. You know, he wanted to work on his projects. He started a lab building uh, measurement instruments because that's what he loved to do. And he had a business partner in that lab that went out and sold the product, but he worked on it. When he had a steam engine, he simply stayed at home and worked on his steam engine. By 69, he actually ran into a fellow, Matthew Bolton, who uh, has a very different background. Matthew Bolton, at that time, was the son of, actually, he had just come, he was born into a manufacturing family. His family business was making metal, metalworks, candle holders, buffet dishes, plates, silverware, agricultural equipment, clocks. And he took over from his father in around 1750 and built a big, built a huge business, probably the biggest metal manufacturing company in England at the time. They had offices in every country that England traded with. And they were quite possibly the largest in the world in terms of, of metal manufacturing. He had just built in the 1760s a state-of-the-art metal manufacturing factory in Soho, which was just outside of Birmingham, which was the, if, if, the, if the Silicon Valley is to computers, you know, then Birmingham is to iron and foundries, into the me making of metal in the 1600s and the 1700s. He had just built the largest and, and the, the biggest state-of-the-art metal manufacturing factory just prior to meeting James Watt. And when Watt met him, Watt actually wrote in a letter to his investors, who were themselves now going bankrupt, saying, 
listen, we need to partner with Matthew Bolton. He's the key to our salvation. And he said it in a way that I, I think is really uh, um, probably better than I could possibly say it. So let me put that up, and, and I will read it to you. I won't expect you to lose your eyes on this. But it's, it's, it's very important because what it reflects is not simply uh, the reality of the situation, but also the transformation of a young sort of optimistic inventor, genius inventor, into a realistic, almost a, what would be, the, you know, not despondent so much because it actually filled him with hope, but much more open businessman. So he's trying to convince uh, his investor, Dr. Roebuck, to, uh, to sell his shares in the company to Bolton. And the reasons why he lists very clearly. First, from Mr. Bolton's own character as an ingenious, honest, and rich man, I don't think he actually put in bold rich, but I suspect that uh, underlying all that was rich. That helped. Secondly, from the difficulty and expense there would be of procuring accurate and honest workmen and providing them with proper utensils and getting a proper overseer or overseers. Thirdly, the success of the engine is far from being verified. If Mr. Bolton takes his chance, it lessens your risk in a greater proportion than I think it will lessen your profits. Fourthly, the assistance of Dr. Bolton's, Mr. Bolton's and Dr. Small's ingenuity if the latter engage in it. And Dr. Small was actually an acquaintance and a, 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 a sort of a, a lieutenant of Mr. Bolton's in his company. Their ingenuity in improving and perfecting the machine may be very considerable and may enable us to get the better of the difficulties that might otherwise damn it. Lastly, consider my uncertain health, my irresolute and inactive disposition, my inability to bargain and struggle for my own with mankind, all of which disqualify me for any great undertaking. That's humility. That's, humi <laughs> That's hard-earned humility. <laughs> because 10 years ago, he was perfectly willing to take 1,000 pounds and go, strike out and, and build a better steam engine. And, so I, and I think that's a, that's a perfect point to make, and, and I want to emphasize that. The point being here is that one of the things Watt discovered, and I, I want to stress in, in the nature of innovation, is that the idea, to paraphrase Churchill, is not the end. It's not the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. And if you want to understand how innovation progresses, you need to take in, you know, keep in mind that really the idea was simply the opportunity to start. And the work that comes after that is the more rich, rich and interesting work, and that's what distinguishes Watt in 69 from Watt in, 18, in, in 1772. Now, what happens after that was about two years where Dr. Roebuck refuses to sell his shares, ultimately does go bankrupt, and Bolton buys all of his shares uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar, in, in the bankruptcy sale from his trustee. So he might have been better off selling earlier. Nonetheless, two years go by, and then, and then Bolton does buy out the, 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 the Watt interest in, uh, um, Roebuck's interest in Watt's company, brings Watt down to Birmingham from Glasgow, sets him up with his best engineers, builds an addition to his factory dedicated to the building of steam engines, and staffs it with 20 of his best craftsmen, and begins to build steam engines. Then he takes a train and he takes Watt down to London where they're, they're looking at essentially a patent that was about to expire in about eight years. They go to Parliament, they talk to some of Bolton's friends, and they get that patent extended for another 25 years. Now all of that actually was the creation of the Bolton and Watt steam engine company. And that's you know, and, and there, I think it's safe to say, the rest is history. From there, they had installed about 500 steam engines by the turn of the century, all replacing existing Newcomen engines in mines and in foundries, uh, and, and dominated the, the steam engine business. But it was those critical first few years, in fact, where Watt recognized his idea was nothing without this. That really shows a, a particularly important part, which comes back even to this notion of basic science, which is... There is financial capital. We are all sort of aware of the role that financial capital plays in innovation. Everybody knows you need money. What few people realize is that's only one form of capital. In fact, what else you need is physical capital. You know, and that may sound simple, but you, you need a plant. You need a place to build your steam engines. And as Watt says, you, know, you need people to build them building that capability, pulling that capital together, takes enormous energy. 
and he wasn't capable of doing that. The third thing you need is intellectual capital. It's also called human capital, which is simply intelligence, experience, what you know. And in the case of Bolton and Watt, Watt understood how to design a steam engine that was radically different from anything that had come before, but he had no idea how to design one that could be built. In fact, he had yet, as he acknowledges in the letter, he, has yet, he had yet to actually design one or build one that worked. When Watt uh, uh, joined Bolton, Bolton very clearly said, I'm going to give you these engineers. They've built metalworks very similar to what you've built. They will help you design this so it can be built, and they will help you build it. And then lastly, social capital. Now, social capital is very interesting, and it differs from intellectual capital. Social capital is not what you know, it's who you know. And it sounds trite, but the fact of the matter is um, Bolton knew a lot of people. Watt knew very few. Bolton knew the people in Parliament who could extend his patent. Bolton knew the people, the scientists, who could add and contribute their value to the development of the steam engine. In fact, Bolton was in correspondence with Ben Franklin about the design of steam engines already. Uh, Bolton was part of the, the Lunar Society. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of them, but they were a society of sort of philosopher scientists working outside of London that shared a lot of the, of the sort of the breakthroughs in science at the time. Uh, and he was able to tap any number of these connections to find new investments to bring in, you know, advantages politically, uh, and, and then ultimately uh, the ability to build an organization. Now, the last thing, of course, they did with that was connect Watt to all of the salesmen across the world that worked for the Bolton Manufacturing Company before and now were available to the Bolton and Watt Company. So I don't want to, I, don't want, I, I guess I don't want to belabor this, but I do want to stress that the world would not have known of Watt had he not met Bolton. Others would have filled his place. There were plenty of other designs coming along with a steam engine, but they wouldn't have been his design and it wouldn't have been him that brought them forward had it not been for his connection his one link to one person, Bolton, who linked him then to everything else he needed to be successful. And that's critical because if we're thinking about innovations today and we think that they're going to naturally come down, if we build a better mousetrap, a green mousetrap, it will out, it won't. You can fund any number of basic research projects, you can come up with any number of enormously powerful findings but if you can't connect them to the right financial, physical, intellectual, and social capital that moves them out of the laboratory and into a startup or into a large company, and then even across that large company into sales and into the market, nothing will happen. And it's that fundamental construction of new networks around the idea that is what makes an idea great. Until then, it's, it's a wonderful notion. So I'm actually going to touch, it was, it's interesting, I look back on my research, I realize I touched on the three, probably the three most significant energy innovations in the last 300 years. Um, if you look at the light bulb, which was really the dawn of the electric age, you'll find an identical story. There were any number of light bulbs before Edison's. Edison's light bulb, in fact, his patent for the incandescent bulb was turned down because it was too similar to one filed 40 years earlier. He didn't invent the incandescent bulb. In fact, we know that there was one burning uh, in, in a laboratory in Boston where Edison worked in the 1850s. So by the time 1878 came around and he began working on his electric light, the idea of electric lights was already done. In fact, Brooklyn, uh, the Central Park and the Brooklyn Bridge were already lit by arc lighting, so the world knew the power of electric lighting. Uh, Edison didn't invent the light bulb, so why do we know him? For the same reason we know what. Edison built a better network around his light bulb than anybody else at the time built. Now, the, the way he did that is several things, but I'll, I'll touch on some of them. First, he had developed in his five years working as an independent inventor deep connections to J.P. Morgan which was all the financial capital he needed. In fact, the reason there is the Pearl Street Station is because it was close by to Morgan's offices. Um, 
he had access to financial capital. Then he brought with him from his history in the telegraph industry the people, the experiences, and even the mechanisms, the artifacts of the telegraph industry, which was the first place in which electromechanics were commercially successful. And he brought with him all of the switches and all of the wiring and all of the understanding of electricity that the telegraph brought. Then he worked with and, and in some cases borrowed from the best advances in generator companies and, and in other competing lighting manufacturers. And then he worked with the gas companies. In fact, J.P. Morgan was one of the big investors in gas companies to borrow the business models of gas to build a network around his light bulb that would be a utility network, quite physically and, and financially a utility network, rather than the independent lighting that everybody else at the time had developed. So if you look even at Edison, while it's really easy, and while you know, sort of all of our textbooks say he invented the light bulb and, and, you know, and the world beat a path to his door, in fact, he, wasn't, you know, he was 30 years late in coming up with a, a commercial light bulb. What he invented was the right network that went around that light bulb that people could buy and would become a utility. If you look at Henry Ford and the automobile, it's the same thing. 20 years worth of commercial autos, be automobiles being manufactured before Henry Ford came along. Henry Ford came along and said, you know, these automobiles cost $2,000. I think the market, there's a market of two dollars to $3,000. I think there's a market for an $800 car. Ultimately brought that price down to about $250. But then that idea of building a car for the masses, uh, again, wasn't his. In any way, you know, any more than, you know, Michael Dell's idea for a portable, a cheap portable computer was his idea. Everybody else has been looking and waiting for that. What Ford did really well was build a network around that idea that would be successful. And I'll touch on a few points on that one. One of which was uh, mass production was nothing more than the, the combination of existing resources brought together from the bicycle manufacturing industry. He bought, uh, he bought factories that made bicycles and he borrowed their machine tools from the canning industry for sheet metal stamping. From the meatpacking industry, he brought the assembly line and all of the low-cost labor that came with it. And then finally, from the bicycle and carriage markets, he brought the distribution channels that would sell as many cars as he could make. What's interesting about Ford, and I think it's very telling because, in fact, it's the same numbers that you could look to with Watt and the steam engine, was that when he started, he was selling 1,500, 1,600 cars a year in 1906. By the time he finished, and that was 5% of the market, when he finished in 1914 with mass production, he was selling 265,000 cars a year, and he had 55% of the market. The reason he could build up that fast and become, in fact, so famous and have such an impact on our, our, even our energy infrastructure is because he didn't invent anything. He took the ideas that were already out there, but he put them together in such a way that they could work under one roof. Mass production was made up of four key elements, interchangeable parts, the ability to put any of, you know, any of 40,000 tires on any of 10,000 cars coming down the line that day, continuous slow production, which is the ability to move the work through the factory smoothly and have every process that must happen happen in the order it would happen. It allows you to not have to keep an inventory of, of work in progress which, if you're building 10,000 cars a day, takes up a lot of space. Third was the assembly line, the ability to move work past the men. And then the fourth was the electric motor, which was the ability, actually, to get off of the steam engine. Prior to Ford, every time you built a factory, you put one of Watt's steam engines or somebody else's in the middle, and you use that to power everything you built around it. And you could only be, you, your factory could only be as big as your steam engine was and if anything broke with the steam engine, the entire factory would shut down. Ford took that notion, threw it out, and put electric motors on every, or on, on every group of, of lathes and mills and everything else that he was using and allowed him to completely redesign the factory. All of which was a set of ideas and a set of connections that he pulled together and were reflected, in fact, in his staff that he built to, to build his factories in creating the network that would make his idea great. Others had the ideas of building low-cost cars. He built a better network to build those low-cost cars. So let me finish with just a, a brief story about, uh, about somebody else, my last story. But I think it characterizes now a different perspective on science.
and particularly a different perspective on the additional responsibilities that, that universities have besides acquiring more federal funding for basic research. So this is the story of Frederick Terman. Uh, interestingly, Frederick Terman's father, Lewis Terman, uh, first, I went, I went to Stanford, so this, this is an interesting sort of re return here for me. Lewis Terman came to Stanford in 1908 as a psychology professor, father of Frederick Terman. He, uh, he's best known for having written the Stanford Binet test, which is the test of individual IQ. At the time, the early 1900s, psychologists in the field of psychology was really dedicated towards understanding how we could identify those homuncular geniuses, those little geniuses in a six-year-old package that would become the leaders of tomorrow. And if we could only identify you know, them by their intelligence, we could devote more of our educational resources to them and by implication, stop wasting on the others. And that will lead us to a greater tomorrow. So now, as I like to point out, somehow surviving that childhood, Frederick Terman grew up to become himself a professor, in this case of radio engineering, which at the time meant radar, vacuum tubes, and all sorts of other things, of engineering at Stanford. Uh, and, uh, and during World War II, he went back to Washington and helped out with, uh, with in fact, much of the science that Vannevar Bush was doing. He's most famous for, what's that? Yeah, for saying, you know, David, this is Bill. Bill, this is David. You guys should get together and start a company. If I can get a $5,000 seed grant from my friend Vannevar Bush in Washington, will you come back to Palo Alto and start Hewlett Packard? And besides, I've got an idea for you of an oscilloscope that you might want to work on, that others have been working on before. He started Silicon, he basically started Hewlett and Packard by introducing Bill and David, and their, their gratitude has, has paid Stanford Bank and, and untold riches, uh, and very told riches. But it's but it's in fact the very nature of Frederick Terman's perspective that I think is missing in a lot of our approach to science today, which is that there is great science being done, but whose responsibility, who on campus has the responsibility of taking that great science and building the networks around it that brings in new funding to start companies? When Shockley left AT&T to start Bell Labs, or excuse me, to start Shockley Labs and work on the transistor more, Terman was in Palo Alto helping him get set up. And when, uh, when the, the first eight people, essentially the first eight engineers that Shockley hired, left him, these are called the traitorous eight, Terman was there to help them get funding from Fairchild Sem uh, Camera to, fund, or to start Fairchild Semiconductor. And those people were Gordon Moore, Bob Noyce. In fact, I think we might even be in the Gordon Moore room right now. Gordon, Bob Noyce, uh, Art Kleiner, I think it was. Um, yeah. We, go, we could go down the list. These were essentially, these are called the Fair Children, and they were the, the fathers of the Silicon Valley. They began most of the semiconductor companies and, and invested you know, first in the initial venture capital community. And for that reason, Frederick Terman is known as the grandfather of the Silicon Valley. Few people know him outside, but almost everybody knows him inside. And what his role was in sort of in looking back to what Watt did and Watt's experience and what Vannevar Bush sort of set up as the scientific paradigm that we're living in now, his role is really a very underappreciated and very unrecognized and oftentimes understaffed role within universities, which is the role of actually seeing the great ideas that come out of research laboratories and recognizing what connections need to be made to combine them with the physical, the intellectual, and ultimately the social capital to make them successful. So in the terms of the pursuit of green innovation, and, I, you know, and it's only green because I simply happen to have talked about the, the, the energy innovations that are, that are probably most critical to us these days, our responsibility as researchers generating new and green technologies is not only to come up with the ideas, but also to help make the connections that move those ideas forward to find that capital that makes an idea happen. So I, I'll, I'll finish there. I think we have time for questions. Um, but that's probably my, my main point. I've said it. Well, I've said enough. So as you, request, as you take, uh, have questions, please use the microphone. Do you have any questions? Let's start over here. Uh, you have a practical um, approach at the Churchill Club. 
which emphasizes venture capital on the peninsula. Right. That meeting's at um, Palo Alto. I don't know if it's churchillclub.org. Yeah. Maybe you could say something about that. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I think what I will say is that uh, Stanford has a, a, an inordinate amount of, of networks running through it, and, and it's, it's Terman's legacy. And you know, you, you can't walk down a hall at the engineering school without bumping into a venture capitalist. Uh, and, and, and I think that's what's interesting is as soon as you leave that campus, uh, the, the, the number of networks, you know, sort of that legacy almost disappears. And the further inland you go, the more uh, it, it's really the, you know, the more normal the science is, which is you, you don't see scientists connecting outside of their field. So yeah, there's an, any number of things that Stanford does really well. It helps to have Sand Hill and all the venture capitalists right there. It helps to have a, a, a culture and a legacy built up from Fred Terman. But as soon as you get to the UC campuses, much of that goes away. I think Berkeley, here at Berkeley, you've probably got the best of all the UC campuses in that sense. But even so, it's nothing compared. And then as soon as you get to you know, any of the other uh, land-grant institutions, you know, you've got you know, Ohio, Nebraska, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin doing amazing work in, in green technologies and absolutely no connection to the kinds of people you would need to know to manufacture them and to fund them and to, and to connect them and to, and to work with policymakers to, to get them supported. Eva, did you have a question? So recognizing there's um, uh, the whole IP management with technology, how does that um, factor in? Because I can see that as a barrier to the VC walking down the hallways of Berkeley or Berkeley Lab. IP is a very interesting subject. It's, uh, and, I, and I spent a lot of time working with it. Uh, one of the challenges with IP is that it doesn't apply equally. So if, if you're in the life sciences, IP can be critical. If you're in engineering, IP can, uh, can sometimes be useless or, or worse than useless. You know, there's somebody, uh, a friend of mine who studies this likes to say, you know, if, if you designed a cure for the common cold and you didn't patent it, it would be worthless because of the expense of, of actually getting it through the clinical trials and, and getting it into the market. There would be nobody who could, could benefit directly from that. But if you patented a, a revolutionary new bridge, it would be worthless because everybody else would figure out a way to get around that patent. In engineering, there's simply too many ways to skin the cat. So there will always be somebody who can come up with a very similar solution and get around the patent. So what you've really done by patenting that bridge is guaranteed that nobody will, will use that design. And I think, so, so one of the challenges we've got with IP is you need, to, you need to recognize that we're actually talking about very different, very different effects. That said, um, uh, there, there's the other question of intellectual property and by dole and, and how universities deal with intellectual property. And there, the UC system has an enormous amount to learn about the process. And, uh, and in fact, probably, uh, this is a very good question apropos to the networks. One of the worst things you can do is delay in, clarity, in, in, in the, the clarity around the intellectual property because networks don't form uh, around an uncertain intellectual property. It's, it, if you don't know whether this will be patented, if you don't know whether you'll actually get the license for it or be able to, to, to license the IP, then nobody's going to invest in you. And that process at the UC system now takes between 6 and 12, 18 months. And it's very difficult to, to find investors who are willing to deal with that uncertainty. So it's a challenge. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Well, thank you thank very you much. So much.